There is a sickness inside us. Rising like the bile that leaves that bitter taste to the back of our throats. It's there on every one of you seated around the table. Only when we know what ails us can we hope to find the cure. What do you make of that? Clearly he's lost his mind. Our thoughts exactly. I'd like you to go to Switzerland and bring Mr. Pembroke back to us. What do we offer here? It's a process of purification away from the pressures of the modern world. You plan to take Mr. Pembroke back with you? Is that a problem? He's a patient, not a prisoner. Are you here for the cure? No. Actually, I was just leaving. No one ever leaves. Welcome back, Mr. Lockhart. Signs of concussion, depleted immune system. I would like to recommend a treatment. Think of it as a cleansing of the mind as much as the body. Some patients experience visions. But rest assured, it's just the toxins leaving the system. There is a terrible darkness here. That was 200 years ago. This is happening now. You said no one ever leaves. What happens to them? I saw the bodies! Listen to yourself. You're not a well man. You're trying to make me think I'm insane. What's happening to me? It's all part of the cure. There is no cure! Accept the diagnosis, and you will see. It's wonderful here. movie of the year. And let's talk about that. My first question, Gore, for you is, you know, you're, you're an incredible director, and the work that you've always made is, is beautiful and, you know, some of the most incredible technical work a director could do, which I'd imagine takes a lot of work. This film is about a workaholic who starts going kind of crazy. I'm curious if that was in any way about you. Uh, wow, relate to that. that's Clever. a good one. Uh, I do. I mean, Are I think... you joking? Did everybody else ask that on your way here? Sorry. No, we never had that question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you, you, know, you make a movie, you spend a lot of time away from your family, and you have uh, you know, guilt and, and all of the things associated with that. And you know, we tried to make this movie about a place that sort of preys upon um, that feeling. There's got to be something inside us that makes us vulnerable to you know, pharmaceutical industry or the kale milkshake or whatever it is where... You know, I think we know in our heart of hearts that something's not right. Now, when you're when you're telling the story, obviously this is a, a a fantasy, a horror film, and and you know you're playing with genre. How much do you feel like you can sort of put those themes into the film and make that critique while at the same time telling this massive, entertaining story? Is it hard to weigh the two? Well, I don't think the film is sort of immediately reducible. I mean, it's kind of its own thing. So um, it's it's definitely contemporary and gothic and a healthy dose of the macabre. But, um, you know, I, I, I think when, when curtain closes, you know, I'd like to think that something lingers, that we've tapped into some sort of contemporary fear as well, and that there's something that sort of sticks with you. How hard is it to make a non-reducible film in today's sort of movie culture? Yeah, it's really difficult. Um, uh, but that has, it's difficult to get people to go, too, you know? I mean, I think uh, you, you see people... Um, you know, more and more often we go to movies and we know so much about what we're going to see. And uh, it didn't used to be all, it didn't used to be that way. You know, you, we used to go to movies and, and know nothing about what was going to happen. And we hadn't played the video game or gone to the theme park or read the graphic novel. Um, so we're trying to sort of, you know, do something a little different and, and, and return to that time. I think it's going to work. I remember when I first saw the trailer for this, you could hear people in the theater very quickly as soon as it ended being, what was that? I, that looks insane which is usually a good sign. I mean, obviously I live in New York and it's Brooklyn audiences and New York audiences, but people were genuinely fascinated by, by the trailer. Yeah, well, we tried to make a, a movie for the fans of, of this type of movie. And Dane, how did you get in, involved in this project? 
Um, I just got a call that Gore wanted to meet with me, and I flew to L.A., and, uh, you know, he talked to me about wanting to make this thriller that was inspired by the thrillers of the 70s, and those are my favorite kinds of scary movies, and he showed me some images and sent me home with the script, and I read it, and, you know, I could see that inspiration, but also I could see that it was something more than that, you know, that there was something really, like, modern and wild and crazy and original about it, you know, and I had never... I had never done anything in this genre, and I, I, you know, certainly it's very different from any kind of movie I've made. So I was, I was all about it. I don't think I've ever seen you play a character sort of like this uh, at all either. Yeah, well, that's what it's all about. You know, I love to challenge myself in different ways and kind of keep people guessing. And when I, when I get an opportunity that is uh, the most different and the most, uh, you know, a different kind of challenge, that's going to be the most appealing to me. You know. Mia, you play a very uh, childlike figure or character in the, in the movie. What was that like? Uh, I really enjoyed it, I, especially because I was kind of, in my own personal life, I was kind of forced to grow up very quickly. So to then be able to, you know, tap into my own inner child and, and innocence and kind of get to see the world in this different and rather peculiar way, I, I, I really enjoyed it. What kind of direction did you get from Gore in terms of how to tap into that? Gore spoke a lot about Hannah's perspective, uh, how she sees the world. She's very curious, very intrigued, and because she's been so sheltered her whole life and, and protected from the outside world, she has a very peculiar way of looking at things and asking about things. And so I guess that was one of uh, the main points between me and Gore and, and how I was able to uh, try and tap into Hannah's um, perspective and how I was trying to connect with her. Jason, uh, your character, I don't want to give anything away. There's a lot that you as an actor, I feel like, get to chew on and, and play with. But there's also a lot that you have to hold back so that things can be revealed later. What was that like for you? I mean, you know right from the beginning where your character's going, but yeah. you kind of have to play with that. Well, I read this, I was sent this script, uh, and uh, I thought, this is the product of some very sick and twisted individuals. Uh, and I phoned Gore, and it turned out to be a thousand times worse than I thought, and he said, come and play. And one of the great things he's created in the story that he wrote with Justin are layers of secrets and the fun for the audience. You guys haven't seen it yet, right? No, okay, so you, when you go and see it, the joy of the journey is that you're tortured by this man and taken as, as things are peeled back and the, and the story takes lefts, right, and, and backwards turns. Bit by bit, secrets are revealed to you. And that is what actors love, is when a camera's pointing at you and you're saying one thing and meaning another and actually driven by a third thing. And it's what audiences love too. The camera and audiences, all of us love secrets in stories. And you're right, it was a five-course banquet of a part for an actor. I have to ask, there's a scene in the film, I don't wanna, I'm not gonna get into super detail because I don't wanna give anything away, but there is a, a dental scene in the movie. Mm. Um, most don't we all love the dentist? Brief, yeah. very brief. It is not brief, that is the thing. <laughs> Most movies, even 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 you know horror movies, I think it was a movie called The Dentist with Corbin Burnson in the '90s that was solely about sort of fetishizing the ways that you could destroy a mouth. Cut away when it was time for for some of that. You, he's not a cutaway guy. Yeah. Sure. Well, I think there's value in sort of you know piercing the membrane once in a while because um, you know if you're if you're dealing with the untrustworthy. Piercing the membrane. Well, yeah, if you're dealing with the untrustworthy narrator, I think you're not quite sure when we're going to go too far and that puts you in a different place as an audience you're watching a movie and you're not you don't trust you know where as opposed to sort of if you're always just brushing up against that then i think you're in your comfort zone and and so yeah if you you know we use the right hook once in a while and then you're not sure when we're going to bring it out again i i watch a lot of horror movies and i rarely squirm when it comes to a horror movie that was a scene that i i squirmed in my seat in the I, theater hands over face screaming i had to go to the dentist during the shoot and we were in Germany, and I had two guys with masks speaking German and <laughs> drilling my face, and that was uh, ironic, I guess. Dan, what was it like shooting that scene, getting the sort of clencher, what are they called, in your mouth? And uh, I don't know what they're called, uh, the things that keep your mouth open things. Uh, it was crazy. Um, that was one of the more... In terms of the amount of torture that I go through in this movie, uh, and the, it's a lot, and the way we shot it, that was one of the more fast uh, shoots. I think it took like two days to shoot that scene, whereas like with the isolation tank, I was in that tank for like two weeks. Um, but yeah, it was it was pretty crazy. It's not, in a way, not a hard scene to act because I was strapped in the chair, my mouth was wide open, there was a 
drill coming at my face, and I was just squealing like a pig. Can I ask a, a, a nerdy question? I mean, you said it takes two, it took two days to shoot that. It took two weeks to shoot the tank scene. That is wild for a film that is this non-reducible to have that kind of privilege, I think, to shoot these beautiful scenes for that and have that much time to do it. What is it that goes into the work of shooting those scenes for two days or, or, or two weeks? Well, the, whenever you get the camera underwater and the actor underwater and you know, you're, you're using underwater microphones and hand signals, um, Things slow down. Uh, you know, there's a danger involved. Um, the tanks filling up. There are the, the eels. The eels. Get in there. Uh, yeah. Very hard. Uh, to very hard to train them to hit a mark. Yeah, you don't. You know, I think. Um, but there's also value. In, you know, we, we were really a, a, a traveling road show. I mean, we went to. A, it feels like we're in one location, but we really traveled all over Germany. We had our exterior castle location in Hohenzollern, and then we went to this very dark hospital that we found that was an abandoned place outside of Bielitz and, um, and a swimming pool in Zwickau. So we're kind of, we're getting a lot of production value from moving around and, and, and then of course when we get on stage and do the water work we have to build some stuff. But Were the locations at all, f come? did they come at all before you wrote the script? Because there was something about these locations are so central to this story that to me it almost felt like someone found them and was like let's make a movie here. N no, well, we yeah, that's how movies are always made. Yeah, right. Yeah. Oops, <laughs> oops, movie. <laughs> Just crapped out another one. Uh, yeah, uh, I I think that um, yeah. We, well, we would you know it started with little storyboards. So there's definitely this sense that we wanted this place that was ancient and it sort of been around a long time and it was like above the clouds, observing modern man and offering a diagnosis because I think we are vulnerable to, 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 you know, we have a kind of, we have issues, and we live in this increasingly irrational world. And We're all trying to diagnose ourselves via WebMD every day for yeah, everything I, we can. I, so we wanted, I wanted some place that sort of felt like it, it you know, and, and as Dane's character Lockhart is making his journey, he's sort of uh, slipping out of bounds. I mean, he's, he's, you know, his phone stops working, his watch stops, he kind of, he ends sort of drifting into this kind of dream logic of this world and leaving the sort of waking state. So you start with that and then and then you you know you start scouting and trying to find stuff that matches your little doodles and and um, that castle was like you know you could look at sort of I mean it's it is almost out of some sort of perverse fairy tale that place. Well, um, the irony being it's correct me if I'm wrong but well, actually don't wrong. Me, don't correct me if I'm wrong. Um, isn't that the castle that they thought had originally inspired Disney to draw the Disney castle? Which That's is a different one. Oh, is it a different one? Yeah. Yes. They so wouldn't I, let us shoot really there. They didn't, like us, uh, they didn't like us at the other castle. Yeah. I, I won't it tell that It was a little too again. quaint, that one. Yeah. This one, I think, has sort of a darker... It has a wonderful circular driveway. But there is... Right. If you go looking for castles, you're going to end up... And I forget the name of that one. Yeah. But hey, Dan, talk about shooting inside wrong. the tank for, for two weeks. Yeah, uh, I was in the tank. Um, basically, I, you know, my body had to stay horizontal, so I was wearing a harness that was connected to these metal cables that were bolted to the side of the tank, so I couldn't move. Uh, my body was horizontal. I was wearing the cast, which was floating up, so they put weights in my cast to level it out. Um, I was breathing through an oxygen tube. There was nothing covering my eyes or my nose. And, um, you know, we did some takes that were like 20 minutes long. So, um, you know, I, I got out of the tank at certain times, but if anything went wrong, which, you know, one time it kind of did, it, we relied on a, a safety diver to come in, cut the cables, and take me out of the tank. Because the tank in the movie, was it was a built set. So there actually was this, I don't know how tall it was, 15, 20 foot tank that they just filled with water. Is that terrifying? Was that terrifying? Um, yeah, sure, but like, uh, yeah. Said, yeah. yeah, but it's like supposed to be, you know what I mean? Um, look, I mean, you, my you, know, you try to do it as safe as possible, but like ultimately, yeah, there's something really scary about it, but you just, you have no, no choice but to give yourself over to that situation, you know? And now, within that scene, and then in another scene that we see in the trailer, Mia, with you in a bathtub, there are a group of, I think you told me in the backstage, freshwater eels. So how are they as scene partners? I feel like it's a bit of a letdown when I tell this story because I was. Don't tell it. Don't tell it. Make something up. It doesn't matter. No one cares about the truth anymore. Don't you know that? <laughs> Good stories are all the counts. Tell a lie again tell and again. Tell an alternative Fake story. Fake news. Who knows how alternative far facts. Who knows how well, far you'll go? It was. It was a very. 
uncomfortable <laughs> scene. I couldn't really move a lot. I wasn't able to scratch my nose or, or, or move at all. So someone fed me a Coca-Cola for a straw and I just had to kind of suffer for about three hours. And then by the end of it, I had all these rashes all over my body and it took a few weeks to, to, to get over that. Wait, that's a, that's good, a good story. Yeah, that's a good like story. It. Is that the alternative story? Is that really what happened? No, You'll that's never really know. what happened. Sort of trimmed up and condensed. <laughs> what a letdown. <laughs> Dan, what about you and the eels? Um, I mean, you know, uh, there were no actual eels in the tank. Oh. Um, sorry, I would not have gotten in that tank. That would have We'd like, still be shooting. You know, they're like, all right, we're going to cable you in, we're going to tie you down, you're going to be breathing through oxygen, and then we're putting eels in. And I think that would have been the point where I was like, no, I'm not getting in. But yeah, I mean, I worked with some real eels. They, uh, they make you squirm. You know, they, I think that's what's great about putting them in a horror movie is they just have this quality that is inherently unlikable and scary, and, you know, that's it. That is so e-list. Can't believe you said that. <laughs> Sorry, man. Jason, there's been, uh, you know, we've we've had a, a slew, I think, of evil doctor characters in our in in our time. Did you were you influenced by any performances before? By the way, he's the good doctor. Yeah, excuse I me. Don't excuse yeah, me. I don't. Uh, no, I wasn't influenced by anything. I just actually was influenced by it was uh, the tone of the film. It's a very unusual film. It doesn't fit, you know, because you're trying to get people to buy a ticket. You have you have to say, put it in boxes. You go to horror as a thriller, but actually, it's a Babinski film is what it is. It's the gore ride. You get in the carriage and keep your hands and feet in and just take him, you know, go where he takes you. And you meet this guy, and he's very charismatic, very powerful, and he's providing simple answers to people's complicated lives and what's troubling people. And uh, it seems like people in today's world want simple answers. And maybe he's right. And uh, we'll find out. You know, Dane arrives and is inherently suspicious of me, but gradually his character comes to think that maybe I have the answer. So I didn't model it on anyone because the character himself has so many interesting secrets and such an interesting story. Uh, I tried... In fact, the opposite. I tried to make sure I didn't look or sound like anybody else. And particularly, I think he probably speaks, I, I never told this, I think he probably speaks every language in Europe, maybe every language in the world. And so I wanted to give him an accent that sounded like, yes, he's German, but uh, he's mixed with only arist aristocracy and the richest people in the world. So, so I started from trying to invent a voice that sounded like nobody else. Don't tell me if I got it wrong. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know if you got it wrong. Uh, Gore, the film is, I think, brimming with homage to films of the thrillers of the 70s, and you referenced the film backstage with me, The Innocence, which is a sort of classic horror film, because I brought up Rosemary's Baby due to the sort of... Coma. Uh, I that? thought... Coma. Do you not think... Were you thinking of Coma, the jean vivre film? Coma. Coma, yeah. Yeah, that's it, yeah. So what were, what were some of the greatest influences on this film and, and, and the look and the, and the story, the, the whole design of it? Well, it's a language, so, you know... If you, if if uh, if I was gonna make a you know a giraffe with an alligator's head, I'd have to have seen an alligator and a giraffe, you know. And I, I grew up with these movies, and so you kind of uh, you know as your as your uh, the, the thing I loved uh, about the the movies that we're sort of talking about, and and um, like Joseph Losey's The Servant or Polanski's A Tenant or the you know certainly Don't Look Now, there's a real sense of something inevitable in those films. There's a kind of overt style. There's a sort of invisible force. And we, Justin and I, we work on the screenplay. We were trying to like, and, and this came to, you know, sort of inform discussions with camera moves and with music and everything was, how do we put a sense of some sickness into the narrative, like a, like a black spot on your x-ray or some sense of, um, you know, the inevitable, that you're, and, and, and Dane's character is very much in denial, uh, but the film isn't, you know, the story is very much, and so things have to become sort of overtly precise, if that makes sense. So you feel like something is accruing constantly, you know, there's a reason he's here that the storyteller knows, but the protagonist doesn't quite know yet. How unreliable of a narrator is Dane's character, in your opinion, is Lockhart? Well, he's not really the narrator, he's the protagonist. Right. So I think the narrator is more in the music and in the mortar and sort of, you know, in the wheezing breaths, in the steam. Um, as, a, as a protagonist, I mean, you, you do have doubts about his, uh, as he gets closer to the sort of darker secrets of this place, he starts to lose his purchase on reality. And, and so you do, you start to doubt, is he in a story that, that, that makes sense to him, or, or, or you know, is he going to wake up? Is he, you know, we're sort of preying upon our understanding of, of the genre. When you when you play that, Dan, are you essentially playing that 
your character believes everything that is happening to him, or are you sort of trying to think about where he falls on on sort of believing his own eyes versus uh, believing what's being told to him? Well, it's just, it's a moment to moment thing. You know, it's just about the truth of the moment. Um, so depending on what, I think there's parts in the story where he's buying into the cure and there's parts of the story where he's skeptical of the cure and he's going on this crazy journey, you know? I mean, um, he goes through so much. So I don't, it's really a moment to moment kind of thing. And ultimately, you know, it's just about showing up on the day figuring out what, what what part of the movie we were shooting that day and the discussions Gore and I had already had about that and then just trying to, you know, seam it all together to, you know, make a compelling performance. But it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a moment-to-moment -moment thing. Uh, let's turn it over to the audience for questions. Who has questions? Right here, you Hi. have a question. That's me. Yeah, I'm super close. Um, so we I was... touch. Like, Look. Yeah, hey, right, high five. Nice. Thank you. I'm done now, that's it. You have the contagion. Um, no, I was wondering, when you're working on a project that's so dark and you sort of go through like these torturous moments, um, as actors, how do you come out of that and you know, step off set and not take all of that home? Or were you guys sort of experiencing like trauma, flashbacks? Well, one of the things that no one's mentioned yet is the uh, place where the vast majority of the sanitarium is set was the worst place I've ever been in my life. It's a, a hospital compound called Bielitz. It's where Hitler was rehabbed after the First World War, where he sent all the Nazis uh, when they were psychologically or physically damaged. Then the Russians took it over. They sent all their political prisoners there, and they lobotomized them and, and gave them electroshock treatment. There have been a series of mass murders there, and it's jinxed a number of other tragedies. Wait, why uh, didn't we start there? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's the most haunted building in Germany, possibly in Europe. And uh, the one building we dressed up for our shoot looked nice, but everywhere else there were places Personally, I didn't want to look up in case I saw people in the windows when they're meant to be abandoned. You can, for me, you could feel the screams and the pain and the torment of the past. And that meant for me, personally at least, I found it just an awful place to be. I mean, it helps for the scenes, but I couldn't wait to get out of there at night. Do you, you I loved it. <laughs> I it. Yeah. Did you really? Yeah. <laughs> I, lo I loved it too. There were I all loved kinds it too. There was some <laughs> There's a darkness, definitely, that you, you know. How much time did you guys spend there? What, how, what was it, how long were you at that particular location? A long time. A long time. I mean, it really was like our back lot, almost. You know, we had a couple buildings that they would build different sets on, and it really was, we had the trailer set up, and it, it was very much like our back lot. It was, you know, it was completely abandoned. I mean, it was covered in vines and broken windows and graffiti, and you kind of had to make your way through this overgrowth to find the place, but the bones were insane. And so we sort of stripped it back. We kind of took two buildings, like one area. We couldn't afford, it's massive. So we couldn't afford to redress all of it. And we, and we found some, you know, some old paint chips um, that we used to inspire the kind of color palette uh, that were in the hallways. And uh, yeah, it was, and yeah, I think when terrible you- Terrible things happened in those rooms. Terrible things have sure. happened. Sure. I mean, you, you, you definitely look. You, as a director, you can't pull a wall. You know, it's frustrating shooting on, on and the walls are like this thick. Um, but you get something from the cast and the crew. It, you know, you show up at this place and you sense, oh, this isn't pretend. Yeah. Right. Next question. Hey guys, uh, just kind of hopping off that question. Uh, how do you guys keep things light, especially for a film that's so scary and gloomy? There's no. We like, didn't. There's no. Yeah, <clears throat> it was five months of dread. Actually, that's partly true. For, I mean, I I generally when I work, I like to play silly music and clown around. But these guys kept very focused. Mia, who's uh, a few films into her brilliant career, uh, has to everything needed to feel real for it, which is the way it ought to be. I, I've become slightly more jaded. But when you're doing scenes with someone who is so intensely in the moment and keeping that that kind of focus around them you try and respect it, so uh, it, it felt like a very intense set. Yeah, the, the first day I, I worked with Jason, he was like, hey man, you wanna get a ping pong table and, um, and play some ping pong in between takes? And I was like, no, what? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, how could I do that? How could I play ping pong and then act? Like it's, a, he, like, it's amazing that he can do that, but... Um, it wasn't but allowed I, on our set either. I mean, <laughs> it, you know, we were, we were there the entire, I mean, Dane and Mia are there the entire time. Jason's popping in and popping out, so he's kind of got this sort of, he's trying to be the comedic relief and we're just going, fuck off, you know? <laughs> uh, that's, that energy is just not allowed here at all. Political prisoners were lobotomized here. We're not yeah, having fun. No ping pong. 
Plus, I'm having a good time. Most of the film, my character is utterly in control. These guys are completely traumatized. As much as acting is pretend, you're trying to force your imagination as close to reality as possible, and so you've got to be respectful of that, unfortunately. Uh, I think we have time for one more question right here. Hey, guys. Uh, I'm a fan of all of your work. Uh, I was wondering uh, about the cinematography, like the shots in the trailer at least look uh, like amazing. Uh, how much work went into that, like maybe pre before the film or during the film? Sure. Yeah, well, uh, uh, I scouted for two months. And, and um, you know, I, I scout with a with a watch and time of day and take pictures and I'll, I'll like hold my watch up and so when Boyan Bazelli who's a cinematographer who's uh, we have a unusual relationship I would say um, uh, symbiotic um, well I, he's beautiful he's passionate but he'll just leave the plot completely I mean he'll just he'll just drift over you know if you let him he'll just go to where the light is and so you but we plan you know we plan yeah he's like talking during takes and running in with bounce you know, he's just all about the light. And I'm very much about the composition, so that we have kind of that, that balance. But I do try to, you know, you, you have the best laid plans. Um, you try to get to this place by 4.30, and you try to shoot that direction in the morning, and you're trying to, you know, um, but and then your stage burns down, and you have to kind of come back a month later, and you miss the weather, and you, so you're in triage mode, uh, and you, you have to completely adjust quite often. Um, your stage burns down? Our you stage burned. Yeah, we were shooting a fire. Yeah, yeah, I mean, are you talking about what is related we were to shooting, the actual... We were shooting. Yeah, we were filming. We had three cameras, and we have... There's a fire scene at the end of the movie in, in the, in the, in the you know, Baron's chambers. Oh, sorry. In the um, aquifer. And, um, yeah, it was a controlled fire, and then it wasn't. <laughs> oh, no. It was pretty Burn instantaneous. Down. It yeah. was on fire Terrifying. for six and a half hours. Yeah, Babelsberg Studio basically burned down. So we had to come back a couple months later. But to answer your question... Yes, it's all, you, you plan it, you know, it's very shot specific, because that's the only way you're going to get, achieve that. It's not, we're not, there's not a lot of coverage uh, when we're shooting a movie like this. You're not this. allowed to say this about yourself, but he's a, a visionary, he's got a, a gift visually, and, and he would arrive every day with this massive storyboard uh, that he had drawn for himself. Reminded me a lot of working with Ridley Scott, who also sees the entire movie, like you said earlier, sees the entire movie. I, I, it's very, very rare to have someone who can, like somebody playing 30 games of chess at, at once. And as an actor, it makes you feel very, very safe. The only thing that made me feel unsafe is the whole thing was drawn out, uh, and he's maybe the worst artist I've ever seen. Only you and Boyan could understand those things. People gather around and say, is that a foot <laughs> or is that me? But that's, you know, the film, on another level, the most important thing is the story, is an absolute feast. I mean, there's a, there's a, a remarkable painter-like gift in the way Gore puts pictures together, I think. How often do you deviate from those storyboards? Do you deviate? I mean, because as you said, your, your DP clearly kind of likes to follow organically what's happening, but you have these set storyboards. Does that plan allow you to deviate a little bit and, and play around, or do well, you stick I think that the, the point of deviation is not so much in the construct of shots. I mean, it's it's very useful to know you're not just shooting close-ups and masters and, you know, that you're you're going to... I draw everything in, in the edit, like how it's going to cut together. Um, I don't... It's not like a shot list. It's like, well, we're going to start here and move here, and then the closest close-up might be the, the hinge or the, the reaction, not even a line of dialogue. Somebody's shifting their eyes or something. And then we kind of widen back out or you kind of find, you know, where is the kind of, yeah, like the hinge in the scene, the turning point. And you orchestrate everything around that and you construct your shots around that. Um, I don't really deviate from that very often. What we do, you know, finding truth in the moment. That's like where, that's these guys' job. And so that's where you leave all, you know, you have time and the room and the space and I try to be very clear on like how this is going to be used precisely, but also take your time to, to, to find something honest in, in this moment. And I think that's where you just sort of turn it over, you know what I mean? Does that ever push you to change the plan? Like you find something in the moment? Sure, you know, but it's usually just, it just ripples a little bit, you know, just everything sort of ripples like three or four shots later, you say, oh, well, that's actually, you know, where you thought the kind of turning point was based on a rehearsal. You kind of go, oh, I see what's happening here. That's the moment I'm going to want to just adjust to. Well, guys, the, the film is beautiful. Congratulations. You've done a, a marvelous job. It comes out this Friday, right? A Cure for Wellness. Thursday Peter's night. Thursday. Thursday. Thursday, Thursday, night. Yeah, you know. Thursday, 8 o'clock for showing. <laughs> Thursday night, A Cure for Wellness will play in theaters all across this country. It's amazing. Go see it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.